Eat Well, Travel Often is sponsored by The Book House, an independent bookstore with a cozy atmosphere where you can browse a plethora of fantastic selections all while enjoying a delicious hot beverage. The shelves at The Book House are specially curated to be packed with gems that make for exceptional reads for patrons of all ages. Owner Nadej Nickel also features many local artists and artisans in a special gallery space, as well as original gifts from socially responsible companies. Their events calendar includes readings from authors, topic discussions, workshops, book club meetings, and more. Whether you're looking for a classic, a bestseller, a hidden treasure, an original gift that gives back, or just a community to join, visit The Book House, located at 281 Essex Street in Milburn, New Jersey, or visit them online at thebookhousemilburn.com. Tell them we said hello. Welcome to Eat Well, Travel Often, a podcast about the intersection of food, travel, the environment, the mind, body, and spirit. I'm Melissa Goldberg. Food is the lens through which I look at life, where it comes from, how it's cooked, its origin. Food creates a community, and how we connect with each other through food is an expression of who we are. I hope to share with you my passion for food from everything from book to plate. Today, I'm talking with cookbook author Nikki Saget, who has traveled from the UK to be with us. Nikki is the author of The Flavor Thesaurus and her newest cookbook, Lateral Cooking, One Dish Leads to Another. The premise of the newest book is if we can master one simple dish, then we've got the start of a very clear path to creating a whole host of other dishes. Nikki calls these connection recipes continuums, and the book is made up of 12 of them. Yeah, thanks for having me. So how do your cookbooks differ from others? So the main um, point, with lateral cooking at least, is uh, as recipe books have become so much the one beautiful color picture on one side of the page and, the, and then adjacent the recipe of how to how to create that thing. Um, and, and now nearly everything is like that. It's, it's certainly in the UK, you nearly always get one picture, one recipe. Uh, what my book does is instead of um, thinking of recipes as self-contained units, it thinks of the whole you know, recipe world as a bunch of flexible ideas that blend into each other. And that they kind of connect up. And if you, you know, if you can think of something that you like to make, uh, lateral cooking will probably tell you about five or ten other things that are just like it, rather than just saying his one thing and has to do it. So let's step back a little bit. You, your first book was the Flavor Thesaurus, and. Um, it's wildly popular all through the world. And did you travel to taste all these flavors or did you study them in your kitchen? How did you come up with this book? Uh, well, all sorts really. So we're going with the flavor thesaurus. When I sat down to write about flavor combinations, sometimes it would come into my head. Oh, that reminds me of somewhere that I've been. So for example, um, there's a section on, uh, kind of red peppers and goat's cheese. And if you've ever been to Corsica, the French island, they eat lots and lots of goat's cheese and often they stuff them into little red peppers. So at that point, I might write about that time that I spent there. And if you eat the thing that you're writing about, it's such an incredible way of getting your mind back into a moment in time and take it all... I find this very interesting if you're ever a writer or if you're ever trying to remember a, a particular scene in your life, if you make the thing that you ate, it can start bringing back all sorts of memories that have been tucked away in dark little corners of your mind. It's such a beautiful thing. So so there are lots of, um, there's lots of writing in both books about places I've been because, you know, you're, you're in somewhere different. And so your mind is a bit more open and your senses are a little bit more alert, I think. And so you get this very interesting um, take on something. And then Sometimes it may, you know, it may not be going to the source. It may not be going to a foreign country to eat something, you know, in its authentic setting. So I'm thinking in lateral cooking, there's a piece about Kia 
the Indian um, rice pudding that's made with basmati rice and lots of spices and lots of sugar. Um, and I didn't eat that in a beautiful, you know, palace restaurant or a fantastic side street kind of place that you have to be in the know in, in, in India. I ate it in a restaurant in the industrial Midlands in England, but a place where there are, you know, a, a road that's famous for lots of Indian um, restaurants. It's a, a uh, Gujarati restaurant and so you know that is that's likely to be as richer experience as far as I'm concerned as as maybe the authentic thing it's just being introduced to uh something new and your senses are completely alert and that makes it much easier to write do you remember the name of the restaurant that it was in Leicester in the one in the industrial north? yeah yeah it's called Bobby's Bobby's yeah so so if ever anybody wants to go, they can go to Bobby's. Yeah, Is it I'm still there? there? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's it's um you know it's it's big. It's one of the, if you walk along the street. I'm trying to remember what the street's called. Uh, it's a very famous street in Leicester, and there are lots and lots of restaurants. A lot of them are Gujarati, and um it, it's the, their food is terrific. A lot of it vegan. Um, there's a lot of vegans out there now. Um, so the flavor source is widely popular. Um. Even Adelangi says, you know, he uses it as a handbook. Why do you think that it's been so popular? <clears throat> well, it was a bit unexpected that it would be quite as popular as it is. Um, I think there is something about it. I think perhaps uh, it's written in a very soulful way. It's um, written by somebody who didn't really set out with anything other than writing a really lovely book about flavor combinations it's written by someone who cooks a lot and who's really interested in I suppose with half an eye on how it's going to be used and um, I also come from a background where I'm used to writing for people to facilitate creativity uh, and so I, I kind of know a way of opening doors and maybe suggesting things and uh, you know little jumping off places it's not a book that tells you what to do it's a book that actually makes hints and ideas of where you might go and so uh, I get you so far in terms of ideas and thoughts and facts and then the rest is kind of dependent on the person and what they bring to it and their knowledge and their experience and I think that's it is lateral cooking too they're kind of like choose your own adventure books you know, you open them up and you can end up somewhere really different. And I think the creative pleasure of that is is huge. And there aren't many books that are necessarily able to do that. So I think I read somewhere, or maybe you had said, that your research for Flavors of Thoris gave you the idea for this book. So can you tell us about that? Yeah, the Flavor of the Thoris is like the mum of, <laughs> of lateral cooking because, uh, because I had to adapt lots of different recipes. Uh, in order to try lots of different flavor combinations. So uh, if I read, for example, that apple and coriander seed were a really good combination, and then I think, well, okay, but I don't know, I, it's not a recipe, it's not a kind of combination that is known for a particular recipe, perhaps. So I'm going to have to put it into something myself and try it. So, you know, what can I do? So I ended up having to adapt lots of recipes in order to try lots of different flavors together in order to write about them nicely and more interestingly. And um, and I so I started to look for a book that was a, a book of skeleton formulas or whatever for, that I could impose flavors on so that I could quickly and easily try lots of different flavor combinations. But then uh, it didn't seem that it existed. So I started taking notes about the same thing so that I could, you know, I could just refer to my notes if I wanted to, you know, adapt something for a risotto or adapt something for a sponge cake. And then uh, after a while, I was using these notes a lot. And I just thought, you know, I think these would be interesting for other people. I think they would be useful. So you must have had a lot of notes because this is a big book to digest. It's, I actually weighed it. It's 3.6 pounds or for the UK's of people from Britain out there, it's 1500 grams. I mean, that's a big hefty book. So um, it's a lot to digest. How do you think it's best used for the average cook? Well, so the way, the, what I'm really hoping for with lateral cooking or what, what overtook my interest from just the 
if you like, it was going to be a book about how to flavor different things. It was going to be this sensible flavoring handbook that people could, you know, just use as a reference for that. But as I got into the research, as I got into looking at more and more and more recipes, I started to see patterns uh, and started to group a lot of the um, the starting point recipes that were forming, uh, you know, the, the backbone of the selection of notes, started to it started to get bigger and bigger and started to become more of a um, a sprawling family tree a genealogy of culinary um uh sorry or dishes from around the world uh and so it yes so that's how it got big so big because there was just so many interesting things to join all together so you have a lot of options there are 12 different sections or continuums as I call them I mean I think uh, it's well you could and I know some people do because they love reading about food you could just kind of sit and read it you know and just learn a bit and see where it takes your mind what make what it makes you want to cook but I think it, my overriding fascination with the whole thing became driven by the idea of learning to cook without recipes and actually finding ways of making it simple to install these ideas, the starting points in, your, in the hard drive of your brain. Um, and so to that end, I think if it was me, I would pick something that I love to eat and then learn it and actually use the book as a guide to get to the point where you don't need to use a book anymore in order to make that thing and the things like it. And so you become somebody who really knows what they're doing, who has a real skill, who, you know, who, who gets rid of the book and starts to see and feel and smell what they're doing. And I know there's like a current fascination with the pasta grannies. I think you, you can become a cook like that but, you know, you, you can't do it by looking at all 77 starting points in one go. You just pick the things that you love or you pick the th- something or you pick, pick something to challenge yourself. I mean, the bread section is one that I love. And I'm not sure I was a great bread maker before I f- wrote the book. But now I can just make I mean, just make dozens and dozens of different breads without any recipe. So let's go through like let's start with the bread section. So how does it start? Like, what is the starting point? And then you go through you know, there's leeways and then there's different paths you can go. So if someone was to pick up that and start with the bread, how does it work? So it's, there's always a danger of talking about the book in theory that it sounds so much more complicated. When you open it, it's a bit more sensible. But what you get is, so let's say you take the bread chapter. The bread chapter starts with an essay, which is, you know, a chat with me and you in my kitchen talking about making bread and then how the six starting points for bread on the continuum, how they link together, how one moves shades into the other so that you understand that uh, everything in the book, everything in that chapter is based on the same ratio of flour to liquid. Uh, and it's really just about changing the liquids and the leaveners that you, you know, that you change the, <coughs> the basic idea of what you're making. So the first point on the bread continuum, which is really, I suppose the bread continuum, you could say, well, it is, there's a certain amount of its simplicity to a more complicated thing. But actually, if you look deeper into it, it's about um, something that's very sparse. Uh, the first one is flour and salt and water uh, to something that ends up being very rich, which is a baba, which is made with flour and eggs and butter and milk. So you're almost getting to the point where it's not become a dough anymore, it's a batter. Uh, and everything in between that is working towards that, um, that enrichment. So, you know, halfway through and you've got a little bit of sugar and a little bit of egg. And, and so, yes, so it's, it's actually, there's, uh, it's rather a beautiful continuum of things shading into the other. And so the, bre- the first one on bread is flour and salt and water. And with that, you can make, um, you know, at its very most basic, a, a lovely bread smelling um, flatbread. But then you can also, using the same starting point, make sober noodles and you can make Scottish oat cakes and you can make matzo crackers. And it's all about just changing the, the meal that you're using, maybe using a little fat. But it's all about really uh, dumping, <laughs> dumping the meal making a well, adding the liquid, bringing it together as a dough. And then, you know, there's some differences about how you finish that off. But, but it's one starting point where you, I, I, you know, tell you how to make a Sri Lankan, how to change it so you can make a Sri Lankan flatbread called polroti, which is made with um, fresh coconut, grated coconut, or something from the Punjab, which is made with chickpea flour and nigella seeds and chopped spinach. There are so many things that you can do to this one basic idea 
And there's lots of fantastic, authentic things from around the world where people are taking the same idea. And then, of course, it's where you want to take it. It's opening up your cupboard and seeing what kind of interesting flowers you've got that you want to use, looking at the aromatics, seeing if you want to grate some vegetables in it, because you have you, you already know this very simple process uh, and the options that you have in order to finish that off. And suddenly you, you have, I mean, you can teach a four-year-old to do this particular one. It's just, it's so simple and it's so beautiful because it just branches and flowers in every direction and and that's it that's one thing and you are, then you've got something in your head that you know always how to cook it's like a family tree of breads yeah or or flower products or just i mean sometimes they're not very catchy it's like unleavened unleavened bread and crackers family oh and noodles because of course there's you know there's a whole noodle section of it but yes that's one family but that's connected, you know, add a little bit of chemical leavener to the same ratio of flour to liquid, and you can make uh, Irish soda bread, you can make um, scones, biscuits, uh, the cobbler topping, they're all made with the same family of, you know, the same dough. And that's the next, that's the next one along, but they are connected by a very small tweak. And if you start to think of that, I mean, that's the biggest difference. If if I think about it, it's that going from thinking of recipes as one color picture and one recipe as a self-contained unit to looking at them as flexible ideas that blend into each other and join up and make you realize that, oh, well, I've made that before, but I didn't realize it's completely like this thing that I've, you know, I've made, I've made that before. And so I must be able to make that and that and that and that. And your confidence and your repertoire grow and flourish and branch and flower as well. And it's just, it's beautiful. Well, and that's, and you talk about pictures. There are no pictures in this book. You have There are drawings. no photos. No photos. There's <laughs> yeah. pictures, right. There, there's drawings. Yeah. So can you tell us about those drawings and, and how you came up with those? Yeah, so uh, for me, it's the same with the flavor of the source. Photographs make no sense. This book is about uh, keying into your imagination, keying into your own ideas. And if you, the trouble with the uh, photograph is it's a finished thing. It's a finished thing, actually. It's usually been made by uh, a professional chef, a stylist, a home economist, and then retouched in a studio. So it's not really, uh, it's not really a real thing. Um, and <clears throat> beautiful as they are, they don't, they don't help your, they don't help your imagination. And I wanted the pictures in the book to be line drawings that you, if you like, you bring your own color to. You color them in with your own imagination you put you look at it and you think oh well you know I'd actually quite like to make a chocolate shoe pastry and fill it with lemon pastry cream uh, because you're sort of looking at those line drawings and you can if you yeah color them in with flavor I suppose is the idea that um, appealed appeals to me as this kind of cook and then you know there are some some just very attractive line drawings along the way to you know to make the book look pretty so you told us about the bread continuum. What are some of the other ones in the book? Like, what are the other starting points? So there are some um, starting points, that, uh, some continuums that make perfect sense. So there's custard, which is a basic baked custard and a custard pie that goes into creme caramel, that goes into creme brulee, which goes into pouring custard or creme anglaise, followed by uh, the ice cream base and then creme patisserie or pastry cream, depending on what you call it and then fried cream. So that's a very smooth, very kind of satisfying continuum, but very, very easy. I think you probably, if you threw yourself, if you threw yourself at the custard continuum, so to speak, I think you probably have that down in a couple of days to a week. You'd be able to do all of that without a recipe ever again. So we have custard, we have cakes and cookies, uh, stock soups and stew. We have roux, which goes from uh, gumbo, to espagnol, to velouté, to bechamel, or white sauce, and then through to sou through souffles to croquettes. I mean, that continuum works on just ever, ever thickener, thickening roux and paler as well. So you've got that very dark roux that goes into gumbo at the start, and then you end up with a big, white, flabby roux that goes at the base of those delicious croquettes that they love so much in Holland and, and Belgium. Uh, we have uh, cornbread, polenta, and gnocchi. Uh, we have a pastry continuum. We have a sauce continuum. You know, okay, we covers this covers a lot of what I would do, you know cooking, taking ingredients, applying heat, and changing their state. You know, so it it not only is a map 
of recipes, but it, or or tra you travel through recipes. You also travel through the world. It sounds like. Yeah, I mean, so I love my primary motive. Uh, getting me into writing books was not to write technical manuals because they're just written by me and they are just my opinion so I write I, I write as if I'm talking to you from my kitchen and so it will be um, I would talk about where I've eaten something or where I've tried this particular flavor or where people you know are particularly keen on um, you know so if I'm going to talk about dal I might talk about you know India, but I might also make a stop in um, the north of England and Wales, where they eat a, something like a dal, but without any aromatics in it. Very English, without any kind of aromatics in it, or an Ethiopian um, lentil dish. Uh, in yeah, in the flavor of the sauce, there's quite a lot of um, travel stuff because I think you, it, it, there is something about certain flavor combinations that take you to a place. You know, so if you're thinking about say how um, uh, you know, so I'm thinking about oh, chicken and potatoes, and you could you could take that to Portugal and write about um, you know the piri piri chicken and fries that they they love so dearly. But I ended up writing about uh, being in France and seeing a rotisserie machine for the first time because they have you know I'd never seen it before, and they have like these raw chickens at the top. So I guess you've never been to Costco. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that was not my my that was my whole rotisserie experience was really romantic it was actually you know walking down a french boulevard and seeing i don't know if they have these in costco but it looks like um it's a massive wrought iron and rivets rotisserie with the with the raw ones at the top and they're all going around and in the bottom of it so it looks like something it looks like something out of a vegas machine you know like a fruit machine kind of thing it's like except with raw chickens instead of pictures of um, crowns and cherries and then, but in the bottom of it is a big trough of fresh potato chips. Oh, I've never seen that before. Now that's no, they don't it. do that in Costco. Well, you know, maybe they should. <laughs> that's the you know, that's what that's what the French are good at, right? They just they just put the potato chips hot and fresh and ready to pack up. So wait, is the rotisserie is the juice from the chickens going down on the chips? That's right. Yeah. Oh my god, it's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> so so that's so there you are. You're thinking like, what am I going to say about you know what can I say about chicken and potatoes? It's interesting, and then you think. Oh yeah, I remember this this lovely thing, and I remember it because it's weird. And so, I, you know, it was very strange to see these, you know, raw chickens at the top, cooked chickens at the bottom. Like you say, chicken fat chips at the bottom. It's like, yeah, I can write about that and for sure. So I think I read somewhere that you know, how many? There's seven hundred uh, seventy base recipes, five hundred leeways, and six hundred flavor combinations. Did you make all this? I have made pretty much everything in the book. Yes, That's a I mean, lot like, of possible? testing. It's a lot of testing, but in a way, to do something as audacious as this book, it has to be tested a lot. And um, there, I just can't. You know, it's not like I can have a team. I can't. You know, I'm not. A, uh, you know, I'm not the Good Housekeeping Institute. I can't pay anyone to do that kind of thing. But more importantly, if I, well, firstly, I have to put my name on it. So I have to believe that it, this is going to work. But I also, I have to write about it. And the only, what makes the book, I think, that much better is that it's, that it's written by someone who's really doing it, who, you know, and I'm not trying to, you know, I don't have to take a cool, objective stance of somebody who's writing a standard um, give it to the people when they're getting married kind of cookery manual. I'm writing a book that is just one, you know, is one person's voice. And so I can say that uh, I think Clefouti is awful and so I haven't included it. I can say that, you know, here is here is a standard thing that you might make using this starting point because it's very popular, but I don't like it or I would change it this way or I think it's too sweet and so I'd use half. That, you get that kind of... Um, uh, you get that leeway to use that word again. Right. Well, what is a leeway? Like, oh, the leeways in the recipe. So the starting point. Starting points are written in a very clear. You could use them if you've never cooked that thing before. Kind of register. So they're you know they're they're clean and clear. Um, but when you get the ingredient like the ingredient list at the top as you normally do, you often see they'll be next to the ingredients um, uh, letters from the alphabet. And then there's a little section that says leeway that corresponds to the letters of the alphabet, which will just say things like. 
uh, you don't need this many eggs if you don't have this many eggs because this is that's a very that's like the reality of people's kitchens is they don't always have the things that they need to make the thing and then recipes very rarely tell you well actually if you don't have so if you don't have bicarbonate of soda baking soda to make something actually you can use this much baking powder but here's the change that you want to make uh, and this is a standard amount of sugar but you can drop it or this is standard amount of sugar and you can't drop it so it just gives you a lot of it's the leeway is the kind of practical changes that you can make to something so I've separated them from if you like the aesthetics uh, which are you know flavors and um, variations but leeway is kind of is is the stuff that I don't want to I don't want you to not make something because you're short of something I, well I love that because sometimes you start something and then you're like oh no I don't have this wait does my neighbor have it no well what can I do and you have that you can go from there I think I told you I made the um biscotti and I think you have fennel and figs I had dates and hazelnuts and it worked great so it did. I love <laughs> I love just like being able to just grab whatever so um so is it for someone just picking up the book what's your tip like how would you start it do you can you just open the page and and start in the middle should you start in the beginning what should you do oh you you, uh, you could start you could open any of the 77 starting points and just make that so if you wanted to use it as a bog standard cooking book then yeah it can be used like that but um you know my ambition for it is that it's uh, you know my i've been saying like that it becomes your you know the nonna that perhaps you didn't have you know for those of us who didn't learn to cook at their mother or grandmother's hip and like learn the techniques and learn to be free and intuitive like that kind of cooked passes down to uh, the people that she teaches this is this is aiming towards the same thing this is saying you know it's never too late actually even if you've been cooking for a really long time uh, and you don't really feel that you've learned much that you apart from learning how to cook a recipe this this book will guide you to to become an intuitive cook, which people always say like, oh, that's really, that sounds so, you know, contradictory. But of course it's not. It's like music. You have to learn to play the notes before you can improvise. It's interesting. I was telling my husband about the book last night and he says, it sounds like jazz. I'm like, what do you mean sounds like jazz? He goes, well, you learn a riff and then you go off from there. And he goes, this is the jazz of a cookbook. And it, and yeah. it kind of, it is. So in terms of, did you learn growing up to cook or did you teach yourself or like, yeah, did I, you have that grandmother who taught you to cook? Well, I, I mean, I had the grandmother who cooked everything by heart. She didn't have any cookbooks. And I remember, you know, watching her make stuff, but I was not, I was very good at eating, very, very interested in food as a child, uh, partly because my, you know, my grand used to make everything. Also, my mum cooked everything from scratch, but I was not, I mean, I left home when I was 18 and I was not interested in um, actually cooking for myself. It was only like about my mid twenties that I started to think, you know, I, actually what it was is I missed my mum's food and uh amongst other things and i managed to get a copy of the book that she used which was a kind of very unglamorous 1970s um book by Mar marks and spencers um sold uh but it was it was quite good very clear recipes and so i kind of t i had to teach myself by using books and sometimes ringing mum you know if i felt like i was getting into a bit of a panic or getting stuck so the average cook can just pick this up and they can start on their continuums and go. Um, one thing I did notice, though, you did throw a lot of humor in this book. Um, in the butter section, uh, the butter cake, you talk about carrot cakes. And what oh, carrot cakes, who likes, I mean, I remember as a kid, carrot cake. But now carrot cakes are pretty decent. What like, happened to carrot cakes? Huh? What? what happened? When was the carrot I, cake revolution? I don't know, <laughs> but it's funny. I, I made a carrot cake recently that I was like, oh, no one's going to like that. They were dying over it because it had ginger and cloves and everything. And it was like more elevated than it used to be. It used to be this thing with some cream cheese on top or whatever. Well, I think, I, well, I'd always thought that maybe what happened to carrot cake was, you know, that we got better recipes from the States because 
in you know when I was growing up, it was something that you always saw in like cathedral or stately home tea rooms and it was always kind of it was a dry it was a penance of cake. it was kind of like a cake for people who didn't want to enjoy their cake too much you know like they felt guilty about having cakes that they had carrot cake and it even sounded like it and then suddenly yeah suddenly carrot cake is really good it's really juicy it's really kind of interesting it's kind of got this delicious much you know the the icing or frosting as you call it definitely got deeper I would say that that really helps. Because the carrots haven't changed. <laughs> no, the carrots, the carrots probably have not got better, to be honest. But uh, and it's the joy of it is it's so easy to make, isn't it? I mean, I I uh, it's one of those kind of things that you make for um, school sales and stuff like that. And everyone, the one that's in lateral cooking, I can shift a lot of that at the kind of school nursery fundraising things. Mm. So is there anything that I didn't ask, or anything that you want someone who would go out and you know purchase this book that they should know um i'm trying to think well what what we've covered it'll build your skills it'll build your repertoire um it'll give you some fun i hope um it'll teach you quite a lot about cooking from all different places across the world i think it will build confidence by making you see how connected things are to things that you already know how to make no, I just I just love the idea of encouraging people to let go of the recipe book and the addiction to recipe books because I don't think, in my experience, they're not great for food waste. So when I used to cook using recipe books all the time, it's very you know I'm not getting rid of my recipe books anytime soon. I like them. I just don't need to keep acquiring more and more and more and more and more. When they encourage you to buy sets of ingredients for to follow one thing, then you've done it. You don't want to make it again for another week or so. So you end up with some stuff and then you start accumulating these things in your fridge. And then you've got this stuff that you've got to use. And I think that that's when people start chucking stuff in the bin because it's gone off or it starts to get slimy. And if you learn how to make things for, you know, if you learn how to adapt things or to kind of make stuff up a bit more, like our grandmothers did, then you start with the ingredients and you you look at what you've got and what needs using and you find a way or, you know, the, the spine of lateral cooking has the names of all the starting points on it. So you can stand there, I think, in your kitchen with an eggplant in your hand and look at, look at the list of all the different things and think, can I make an eggplant this? Can I make an eggplant that? Could I put it in that? Could... So you've actually got like a prompt list of like, oh, what might I put it in? So you can use your starting point would be instead of the book as a starting point, you open your fridge and you use that as a starting point. And Absolutely. then you go to the book and go, where can I take this now? That's great. Absolutely. I mean, the book will really encourage it, particularly even with, you know, not just fresh produce, but with your grains, you know, it's very easy to put the grains in the larder and then not see that you've got some cornmeal that needs using up, some buckwheat flour that you did an experiment with that's about to, you know, they're going out of date. There are so many things that you can do. There's so many interesting starting points, like in the polenta section, that you can mess around with and you can maybe make a halva with those things that you would never have thought of doing. But it's very similar to making a cornbread. And so there's just so, yeah. So we go, let's do a bit more ingredient first and throw less stuff away. And become more creative in the process. It's a very fulfilling kind of virtuous circle. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I find being in the kitchen very therapeutic, or my. It's just enjoyable to be making in the kitchen. But I have uh, one more question for you, and it's out of the kitchen. You're here from the UK, and there's a lot of good restaurants in the UK. Do you have one favorite that you can recommend in London? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, okay, so I don't like to spend too much money because I have to pay for a babysitter <laughs> when we go out. So it's going to be a moderately priced thing, which is um, uh, realistic. Uh, so I live near a really great place in London called Exmouth Market. It may be not, it may not be somewhere that you would end up, but it's kind of it's, it's fairly close to the middle of town, uh, and it's very cute and it's very independent. And they have uh, well, the, the place is called Morito, and in fact, it's the small. Um, sister of a restaurant next door called Moro, which is wonderful, but we go to Morito because it's a tapas bar. But um, it's not just Spanish, it's North African too. And it never lets me down. It never lets me down. Everything is just always, always terrific. Um, lovely wine. It's always busy. It's 
it's just it's a very very successful place for me so that I feel comfortable saying yeah that would be that's often my number one choice when I want to be um, sure that I'm going to get a good night well that's great well thank you Nikki for taking the time with us good luck on your book we wish you well and everybody should get cooking and eat well and travel often thank you very much for having me And now we are at the Book to Play segment of Eat Well, Travel Often podcast. Here, I report back to you my personal experience. It could be a cookbook I cook from, a restaurant I ate at, even a place I recently visited. If you have any suggestions, please reach out to me. Let me tell you about my Book to Plate experience cooking with Nikki's book, Lateral Cooking, One Dish Leads to Another. This is more than a cookbook. It is Nikki's years of research into recipes and how they connect to each other. It's very impressive. But if you're looking for that cookbook that you just open up, find a recipe, see pretty pictures, this is not the cookbook for you. There's a little reading involved, but I think if you take the time to really use it, it will make you a better cook. I started with the chocolate section because chocolate, why not? That's the best place to start, right? I decided to make the chocolate truffles with my 13-year-old son. I was a bit annoyed because rolling the truffles into neat balls was not easy. My son quit on me because I kept getting mad at him and saying that his truffles look like emoji poos. Anyway, I also decided to do two different coatings, cocoa powder and powdered sugar. After a few, I noticed the powdered sugar was not working. It was getting absorbed in the chocolate, so I aborted that. Overall, I really didn't like the way my truffles look, but after I met Nikki and I showed them to her, she said they were perfect and that I could sell them in the store. (laughs) Really? Anybody want to open a truffle shop? (laughs) Anyway, then I moved on to the cookie section. Um, Instead of starting with the basic cookie recipe, I wanted to make the biscottis. Nikki's recipe is for fig, almond, and fennel biscotti, but I didn't have figs or fennel, and I don't even like fennel, so I wouldn't even have that in my house. So I went into the pantry, and I saw I had dates and almonds and hazelnuts. So that's what I did. Oh my, these cookies are so good. I didn't want to share them with anybody. The last recipe I made from Nikki's cookbook was the butter cake. The recipe includes cake pan variations, which I love because I can't tell you how many times I've gone in my cabinet and brought out the ruler to measure the size of the cake pan. Did it fit with the recipe? Here, you have options. It's great. I decided to go with a loaf pan and make it just like a pound cake. It came out moist, delicious. It was great. It was simple. And now I can go on from learning this basic recipe to a lot of varieties which she has in the book. If you want to become a better cook, this is definitely a book for you. You master the basic recipe and then there's so many other places you can go. I think Dr. Sue said something like that. Or did he say, the more you read, the more things you know? Well, this is the more you cook, the better cook you'll be. A special thanks to Nikki Seget for taking the time to talk with me. If you want to find out more about Nikki, you can go to eatwelltraveloften.net where you can find show notes, recipes, travel tips, and more. You can reach me via email at melissa at eatwelltraveloften.net or on social media. I'd love to hear comments and recommendations. Thank you and eat well, travel often.